I fully support the blueprint and I was proud to lobby with our educators in Annapolis to get it passed. Um, but it goes back to the perspective that I bring as a product of Maryland public schools. I also went to a Title I elementary school, which had mold on the ceilings, overcrowded with students and great educators who just didn't have the resources they needed. So my education plan uh, looks at the entire system comprehensively. So that means universal pre-K, affordable childcare, easing student debt for educators and students, reducing the barriers to becoming an educator so we actually have diverse educators that represent the students, making sure we prioritize funding for schools in low-income neighborhoods and using prevailing wage laws, making sure we tackle affordable housing because a lot of educators can't even teach where, can't even live where they teach. Moving away from standardized testing to more performance-based testing, mandating require, uh, financial literacy credits to graduate high school, making sure we have sex ed in all of our health classes, removing SROs and replacing them with more guidance counselors and social workers. So we actually get to the root causes of some of these issues and making sure we're investing in after school programs. I think from a K through 12 perspective, those are some of the tangible next steps that we can build upon the blueprint, but really tackle the issue sustainably. Yeah, so it's not so much that I differ on uh, the priorities of the blueprint. A lot of those priorities are things that I've been advocating for for a long time. It is more about how do we actually execute and implement those priorities and actually tackle the entire system in a comprehensive way. I think a lot of times uh, residents feel that elected officials, candidates, or even their governor may say that they care about public education and then veto certain pieces of legislation that could provide that support. They say that uh, you know candidates want to help folks regardless of their zip code, but then they see different monies not being allocated to those communities that really need those resources. And that's where I'm offering a different perspective. And it also starts with how you campaign, making sure that residents, parents, students, and educators actually have a seat at the table from day one, not just waiting until after the election to include them. I, mean, I think there's a lot of great things that are being done, but it's there's still a big discrepancy based on where in the state you live. If you live in Western Maryland, if you live in the Eastern Shore, if you live in Baltimore, uh, if you live in areas that have uh, predominantly minority communities, we're seeing that the resources are not being allocated sufficiently and sustainably. We're also seeing that uh, when residents vote, for example, for slots and are promised by elected officials that that money would be allocated for public education, and then it doesn't end up being that way, that's where I think we have a lot of frustration. And I think we need to rebuild community trust uh, with our elected officials and have those elected officials continue to appoint leaders who understand the same lived experiences of the residents and communities we're trying to serve. We need to make sure, first of all, that if you are a true public servant, uh, servant and trying to get into law enforcement as a career, we need to support you. At the same time, when black and brown individuals are being disproportionately sentenced or even killed by these public servants, we clearly have a severe problem with our criminal justice system. And keep in mind that accountability that does not diminish whatever good work is being done, but we demand accountability in every other field and our criminal justice system should be no different. Now, just because there's no one reason for crime, no one solution for crime, we have to tackle again, the issue of criminal justice comprehensively. And that's why in my plan, we talk about everything from ending extreme sentences for children, ending the money bail system, continuing the end of for-profit prison contracts, treating opioid and drug use finally as a disease, not as a crime, investing in more mental health professionals, preparing those in prison for life outside of prison, making sure we have independent oversight and accountability, and making sure we do things like legalize marijuana while expunging records, and make sure that folks have access to good jobs and a decreased cost of living. That will not only help law enforcement officers, and get them the resources they actually need to do their jobs, but it will also build better community trust and make sure that residents of our society actually are able to live the lives they want to in a safe manner with greater respect for law enforcement. And we do have law enforcement officers who are also part of our large team um, and actually helping make a lot of the policies I just mentioned, but again, in partnership with communities of color, with younger folks, with folks who feel marginalized 
and discriminated against in the criminal justice system. And the way we do that is by taking out the hateful rhetoric that we sometimes see in our national discourse and making sure, for example, that we are training 911 dispatchers to assess that if a caller does not present immediate danger to themselves or to the community, send a social worker in addition to a law enforcement officer. And when we talk to police officers, they say, yes, that is gonna help us do our jobs better because we're not fully equipped to help those with mental issues in the community. And it also helps those with disabilities, people of color, uh, or anyone who needs the resources at the source to actually not, you know, to actually get the help that they deserve. So again, when you look at all these issues comprehensively, what we're finding is by removing the rhetoric, looking at the entire system and having practical next steps, we're actually able to build better community trust, actually allow public servants to do their jobs better, recruit more individuals who represent constituents, uh, and again, build community trust. So that touches on three things. One is my small business platform that's been shared on my website, janeforgovernor.com a year and a half ago. Second thing is it touches on my uh, infrastructure uh, policy memo that is also shared on my website and my Maryland Now plan. So kind of diving in a little deeper on all of those. When it comes to infrastructure, we need to have smart growth and mixed use development. I support the purple line, the red line, a Southern Maryland rapid transit project, expanding mark train services, sustainably expanding the Bay Bridge uh, by using what the environmental impact study conducted proved to have a singular eight to 10 lane bridge. But I would mandate that at least one or two of those lanes are designated for HOV or buses and making sure we don't forget about the access roads. I do oppose adding toll lanes to I-270 uh, because it is gonna be too expensive for residents to use. And that is an area where we can encourage more designated bus lanes, marked train services, metro stops, as well as encourage transit options. That goes into my Maryland Now plan. The Maryland Now plan will do a couple things. In addition to eliminating the state income tax for 95% of Marylanders and creating a guaranteed jobs program, my plan will make public transit where it's already available completely free for every resident. And this will not only help students get to and from school, it will not only help seniors and those with disabilities get to and from wherever they need to get to, but it will help our businesses get to and from their employees and vice versa, and also to customers. And in doing so, we can help our climate, we can help with the economic sustainability of our state, and we can also encourage more businesses to move into our state and stay in our state. The way we're gonna pay for it is by keeping that, uh, that's, uh, that's taxed the same for anyone who makes more than $400,000. We're gonna increase the fossil fuel fee for any of the polluters, uh, the companies that emit fossil fuels. We're gonna make sure to legalize and tax marijuana. And we will also in the short term, increase the sales tax from 6% to 7.5%. Now, what we find is most Marylanders pay anywhere from $600 to $800 a year in sales tax, but up to $2,000 a year in state income tax. So by getting rid of the bigger tax, not touching property taxes, not cutting services, and coupling it with a guaranteed jobs program, affordable housing, and infrastructure, we can make sure more residents have increased disposable income, and allow more folks to retire in our state while encouraging more folks and businesses to move into our state. So while I would be the nation's youngest governor, there are four reasons why people should vote for me. Number one, because I'm fully accessible with 100% of my events being free and I'm the only governor candidate to personally and consistently meet voters at their homes in all 24 counties. Number two, I am fully accountable. We created the first statewide campaign in the nation that is 100% crowdsourced and run by residents from every age, every background in all 24 counties. Number three, I'm fully transparent. We have shared the most detailed and paid for policy agenda on my website a year and a half ago in January of 2021. And the fourth and final reason is because I have both the professional and lived experiences to really serve the residents of Maryland well. As a 32 year old cancer survivor, as a son of immigrants and small business owners, as a product of Maryland public schools, and as someone who has worked in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, including the Obama White House and two federal agencies, I think those are the perspectives that we need in the governor's office more than ever.